Though I have at least somewhat kept up with the Splatoon series ever since it was first revealed, I never actually played any of the games until mid-2018, when I got Splatoon 2. An, uh, online friend group I was with at the time was into this game, and I didn't want to feel left out. Eminem Gaming 13, if you're watching this, thank you for ruining my life. As my first Splatoon game, I hold a ton of nostalgia for it, thanks to its chill vibes, striking presentation, fantastic fests, and so many staple additions to the series, for better or for worse. Going back to it now, however, you are are met with unskippable news, unbearable queue times, limited time windows for Salmon Run, floaty controls, poor balancing that heavily favors shooters, and abysmal special weapon design that makes Trizuka look fun to fight. A lot of people seem to agree that 2 is the weakest Splatoon game, and despite how much I love it due to nostalgia and its vibes, I can easily see why. In addition to the problems I just went over, as well as a lack of content at launch, the map design is also noticeably safer than it was in the first game. They aren't necessarily terrible, but most of them lack the creative spark that one's map had in favor of more simple, often forgettable layouts, and it doesn't help that many of the returning maps from the first game were the weaker ones. Thankfully, it's not completely hopeless since there are still quite a few fun maps in this game. Plus, this game's Splatfest also featured the Shifty Stations, a series of wacky, gimmicky turf war maps that changed with each fest, courtesy of Marina. I will be ranking them in conjunction with the main maps, but since I don't want this video to be too long, I'll be ranking most of them in quick succession, akin to my Doom level ranking, only giving one of them a proper entry. Face it, you already know the one. Also, because the shifty stations are locked to turf war, and also because turf was all 13 year old me played at this game's multiplayer, and because this game's current state of ranks is utterly abysmal, I will once again be ranking the maps from the filthiest of filthy casual views. Anyway, y'all know what time it is. It's ranking time! <laughs> As a 13-year-old newbie, I didn't really have any critical thought on the series' maps. I had no knowledge of level design and what makes it work or not, and only picked favorites depending on the maps I was most used to. I couldn't even tell a few maps apart from each other. Seriously, I was an Aerospray main whose favorite map was Moray Towers. Dark times, I know. However, there was one map that was introduced while I was getting into the game that I distinctly remember viscerally despising. A map so unfun and monotonous that not even a filthy casual enjoyed it and my hatred of it persists to this very day. Wahoo World! Don't let the fun setting and wide space fool you, because this park is anything but amusing. To reach mid, you have to hop off a ton of one-way drops, so you can't retreat to your base without super jumping or dying. The tiny, cramped middle platform is the key to controlling the battle, and there are only two routes to reach it. One forces you across uninkable ground that leaves you highly vulnerable, and the other is inkable, but it retracts every now and then, forcing you to go across the uninkable ground. Sure, you could try to loop around the back with the lower section, but good luck dealing with the slow as hell walls. Everything about this map is designed to impede movement, punish strategy, and frustrate players. It combines nearly every aspect I hate about Splatoon map design, and I go out of my way to avoid this hellscape whenever it's on rotation. It doesn't even have the pull. How can I enjoy this? There's no pull. What a travesty. If I ever cross paths with this piece of shit again, I am going to be f***ing livid. <laughs> Wally. I've noticed a trend when it comes to the Splatoon 1 maps that return in later games. Most of the best maps from that game got noticeably worse in later entries, while the weaker ones all got at least a tiny bit better, with the sole exception of Walleye Warehouse. What changed about this map for the worse, you might ask? Nothing. It's the exact same shitty Tetramino it was in the first game. If nothing about its layout changed, how is it worse? It's simple. This is Splatoon 2, the game where 90% of the maps are crippled by the existence of Stingray. This bad boy can see and kill you through walls, completely invalidating this map's already unhelpful side routes and forcing you down the middle, where you'll probably just die from someone else's weaponry anyway. It's only safe from F tier by the small size making trips to mid quick, and the two side routes being available at all, despite being janky. Bare minimum positives, I know, but as someone who's put hundreds of hours into 3, I'll have to take what I can get. Anyway, at number 45, the worst shifty station is the Bouncy Twins. It's a tiny straight line with a few bounce pads, which kill your momentum and make you very vulnerable, and the rest of the layout does not help its case. It's only saved from F tier by some of the jumps being fun to land. Number 44, a swiftly tilting balance. The devs programmed entire weight values for players and sub weapons just for this one station. Honestly, a waste of effort since the gimmick is inconsequential and the rest of the layout is also pretty bland. What was Marina on when designing these? <laughs> 
Let's be honest, does anyone miss Gobi Arena? Aside from its cool setting, what is there to like about this map? It's got cramped spawn areas, and the few routes you have to get to its bland mid are all narrow. If you want to make a push, you're not going to easily get through mid, let alone around it. There are only three routes into the enemy base. One forces you to make a risky jump from the basketball stand, while the other two take you across uninkable ground. Seriously, what is the purpose behind uninkable ground? I can usually understand walls, but the floor does nothing but slow you down and make you vulnerable. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that not letting you swim in ink in a game built around swimming in ink is not good design. Muscle Forge Fitness seems like a moderately decent time at first glance, with various vantage points and a good chunk of elevation in mid. Then you notice that the only way to push into the enemy base is to head across a thin grate, which leads you to an impassable wall that forces you to walk on another risky grate. This is somewhat mitigated on some of the ranked modes thanks to an added ramp, but that still isn't enough to make up for this map's dull aesthetic, cramped spawn regions, tedious terrain, and plethora of one-way drops. It bores me to tears, and I am begging Nintendo to keep it away from 3. Number 41, Zappy Long Shocking. Bro thinks he's Ancho V Games. The ink switches just aren't nearly as fun as the propeller lifts, and the platforms and walls they raise are more annoying than fun. I wish I could say more about it, but it's just a port. Yay, Port Mackerel, my favorite map. To be fair, Mackerel is among the bad Splatoon 1 maps that got at least a tiny bit better. It's a lot wider, with many of the crates being shrunk down to allow more movement. A few were even made properly inkable, and therefore much more accessible. The addition of sponges also helps a ton with getting to higher ground and providing cover. Sadly, even with these upgrades, it's still Port Mackerel at the end of the day. Boring theme, boring layout, boring experience. Number 39, Way Slide Cool. Wow, two chunks of land slowly move. What a creative hook. The uninspired, somewhat annoying gimmick and cramped layout really dragged this one down, but I don't want to fault Marina too much for this. It was her first shifty station, and besides, she definitely proved to be a very strong game designer later on. Excuse me. We ordered room service an hour ago. New Albacore Hotel is a map that seems like it would be a slam dunk at first glance. Not only is it large with a ton of roots, but it's also pure eye candy. The calming pool at the top of such a tall hotel provides such a chill vibe, even more so than Mahi Mahi Resort. It looks like it has everything going for it. And then you play it. <laughs> While the layout is fairly big, it's also flat, narrow, and occasionally bumpy, with a ton of holes that can impede movement and cause you to fall off mid-fight. Worse yet, there are only two ways to enter and leave mid, one of which forces you across grates that you can't swim across. At least the inkable route doesn't close itself off half the time, but that should be Shooter Map Design 101. God, what a frustrating map. It has one of the best aesthetics out of any map in the series, but that matters little when it also has such a boring, tedious layout. If it weren't for its stunning looks, it would be an easy D tier, so Good job on barely making it to C tier, buddy. Maybe I should try Humpback. No, don't try Humpback. For whatever reason, I remember really hating Humpback Pump Track when I was younger. But nowadays, I honestly don't mind it all that much. Mind you, it's still not really that good, at least in this game. While the hilly terrain makes great use of this map's theme, it can also be a bit annoying to maneuver around, especially with how many one-way drops there are. To be fair, there are numerous ways to get to the sides and bases in this map, which make it feel a bit more open than others in this game. Even so, a lack of cover in mid can leave you wide open to getting sniped from the sides, and dealing with backlines can be annoying due to the narrow flanks. Overall, an okay enough casual turf war map, but I'd still much rather play on various other ones. <laughs> Schellendorf Institute is essentially a better version of Walleye Warehouse, and yet it's still not that good. There are a ton of ways to approach mid, but once you're there, it's hard to get out. The only way to retreat back to your base or push into the enemy base is to swim to one of the sides and swim up a wall to reach the glass ceiling. The ceiling's a neat gimmick in theory, but it ends up making some weapons extremely vulnerable and others nigh unstoppable. The map does get saved a little bit by numerous ways to traverse to and in mid, and it can also be fun to drop from the ceiling, but aside from that, I don't really care for Schellendorf. At least this Schellendorf doesn't constantly yap about useless weapons, I guess. In the highest room of the tallest tower. Despite how polarizing Moray Towers was back in Splatoon 1, it was, for whatever reason, so iconic they brought it back in 2 on release. It's... 
a bit better, I guess. Its mid feels a lot wider in this game, with many more ways to get around it and into the enemy base, and the addition of ink rails also makes it more fun to fight in. Outside of mid, however, they didn't do much to rework this map for the better, so it's still not that good. At least I can play it without completely boring myself to tears now. Number 34, Railway Chillin'. It has a solid layout with a good amount of movement options, but it's crippled by, funnily enough, the grind rails. They don't mesh well with online multiplayer at all, since the fixed speed they leave you at makes you vulnerable to enemy fire. Maybe if you stop camping, you get a better PR. Wow, another mediocre Splatoon 1 map that got slightly better. What a shock. The base floodgates have merged, and the podium they lead to is a lot wider. Various ink rails have also been added, so it's now much easier to switch between the two bridges. While I appreciate the improvements, I still don't find Camp Triggerfish particularly fun. The terrain is just still too narrow for me to move efficiently or have fun. Some summer camp Triggerfish is. Day 93 under the dome. Oh my god, when does the onslaught of lesser Splatoon 1 maps end? Kelp Dome is fine. Unless the other team decides to break it with Stingrays, it is perfectly fine. Shooting people from atop the grates can be fun, mid is fun to fight in thanks to the inkable wall, everywhere else is annoying due to the lack of inkable walls, pretty much everything I said about this map in my Splatoon 1 map ranking still applies. It is very great, but not great. Number 31, the Splatinar Zones. This map is covered with splat zones that fill themselves up when you ink them enough, making it basically regular ass turf war with a slight alteration. It's a lame gimmick, and the Tetris layout does not help. Number 30, Windmill House on the Pearly. Museum Delfoncino at home. The spinners are annoying to deal with, especially the uninkable ones in mid, and the rest of the layout is also really tiny and forgettable. Skipper! Over here! The map designers clearly learned from Salt Spray Rig and tried to make an actually functional lateral map with Skipper Pavilion. I love the traditional Japanese aesthetic, and it blends really well with the map's format, but the layout itself isn't exactly anything to write home about. The main issue with the map is the trench in the middle. Running up it from the north end looks cool, yes, but it's walled off on either side, with sponges being your only means of retreating to your base on some modes. The south end is a complete choke point too, with only one way to exit that can easily be blocked off. The theming and the terrain outside the trench put it above some of the other C tier maps for me, but it's still a pretty disappointing final non-shifty station map for this game. Number 28, Fancy Spew. A Tetris block where a bunch of spreaders ink the ground in set colors. Is that the best you could come up with, Marina? The middle spinner with the inkable walls and tips kind of carries this one, but not by much. To quote Marina Ida, Inkblot Art Academy is a place that exists. Honestly, that's exactly how I describe it. I've never been the biggest fan of Inkblot Art Academy. I don't mind playing on it, but I've never seen myself dying to play on it. There is a lot to like about this map, such as its varying routes to mid, with my personal favorite being this tunnel from spawn that takes you straight to this side area. The big block directly in the center can also be fun to use. However, the map is full of one-way drops, and the walls extend very far into mid. Depending on the mode, your only ways to break into the enemy base are to walk up this uninkable ramp or jump from the center block. Both routes leave you vulnerable, so good luck dealing with the oppressive backline players. Part of my slight distaste for this map could come from the fact that I've played it so many times across 2 and 3, but I don't know, I just don't really vibe with this map all that much. It's still decent, I guess, but I've seen much better. Number 26, Flutters in the Attic. It's another straight line, but the flutters can be kind of fun to survey and run from. It also somehow uses bounce pads better than the bouncy twins, so there's that. And with that, we can finally move on to the good map. Huh? Oh yeah, Splatoon 2 introduced Salmon Run to the series. It's... It's a mode. After playing 3 for so long, it finally hit me how slow and boring the original iteration of Salmon Run was, even looking past its limited time windows. The lesser salmonids feel like tiny pebbles, and it can sometimes take forever to get golden eggs back to the basket. It can still be kind of fun, but I tend to get bored of it after like two shifts in a row. It also happens to have some maps of its own, which I will be giving their own ranking, hence why Mr. Grizz rudely interrupted me in the middle of the video. <laughs> Number 5, Salmonid Smokeyard. The two islands are cramped, and trying to use the propeller lifts to move between them with salmonids on your ass feels awful. At least it has some inkable walls, I guess. Number 4, Marooner's Bay. Propeller lifts and Salmon Run clearly do not mix. I don't know why they force us to use these when inkable walls would have been much more convenient. The bottom two spots could honestly be interchanged. I only prefer Marooner's Bay over Smokeyard in this game because at least I can actually move on it. Number 3, Lost Outpost. It's a bit flat, sure, but the fortress design really carries it. It's fun to shoot salmon 
contaminants through the windows, and I'd love to see it make use of squid surging if they bring it back in a later game. Number two, spawning grounds. The quintessential salmon run map of this game, with tons of inkable walls, elevation, and grates. It can get a bit cramped on high and low tide, but it's still quite fun. And number one, ruins of Arc Polaris. It's number one because of the grind rails, let's be honest, and I guess the pretty skybox, the tall height, the plethora of inkable walls, and its significance to the lore as of three. Overall, Salmon Run was a fine but forgettable experiment in Splatoon 2 that thankfully paved the way for an excellent mode in 3. Now, it's time to finally get to the good multiplayer maps of this game. Why should you be carving Starfish? Starfish main stage is basically, what if Hagglefish was good? It's designed in a way that tries to funnel you into mid, but there are still various ways to reach it, and it even has some routes off to the side that let you swing around mid or climb up to strike from above. There are also various routes into the enemy base, and the bases have a lot of defensive potential with a ton of inkable walls. It can sadly feel a little narrow in a few areas, and backline weapons can also feel a bit too strong sometimes. Despite those complaints, Starfish Main Stage is a very solid deathmatch-style map that I often have fun on. Not sure why they chose this map for the box art over a significantly better map we'll see later on, but it's good stuff. Number 24, Goo Sponge. The layout's a bit straight, which is out of character for Marina, but it's made up for by the sponges. Filling them up to access higher ground or to use as cover is pretty fun. Number 23, Bridge to Tennis Switchia. The titular bridge in the middle can be moved with the ink switch, locking you out of painting big patches of it. This creates a fun dilemma of whether to move the bridge quickly or take your time and paint as much as possible. The rest of the layout's kinda eh, but the gimmick is simply genius. You need a ship. No ship, Sherlock. Apparently, a lot of people really hate Sturgeon Shipyard. I don't know why. This map does so many things right, and I'm surprised people consider it one of the bad ones. The spawn regions are massive, with a ton of area to ink before heading to battle with your specials fully charged. The middle areas also offer a lot of varied terrain, and it's really fun to swim all the way around it into the top of the podiums to do battle. Some of the platforms in this region also raise and lower at times, and they offer different movement options depending on their orientation. You can swim across them when they're lowered, and when they're raised, you can swim up them to easily get to the high ground to take care of snipers. Regardless of their position, they always provide a movement option, rather than just blocking you off half the time, like on other maps. To be fair, there are a lot of one-way drops, making the bases kind of hard to attack. It's also really easy to get trapped in this one corner in mid, and it's aesthetically kind of on the dull side. Even still, I always have a good time on Sturgeon Shipyard, and it's definitely a far better industrial seaside map than Port Mackerel ever was. Number 21, Cannon Fire Pearl. Cannons and Turf War mix very well. It's a lot of fun to bury the whole map in ink from afar, but it still gets dragged down by the cannon shots being hard to avoid if you're on the receiving end of their fire. Number 20, Zone of Glass. A very twisted layout that makes me think of Robo Ramen from 3. This station isn't as good as ramen, but it's still a lot of fun with its tricky gimmick of invisible walkways, as well as a fair amount of elevation. My life is like a video game. Finally, a good Splatoon 1 map! and it's significantly inferior to how it was in the first game. If you saw my Splatoon 1 map ranking, you'll know that I ranked Anchovy Games in the top three. I absolutely adored it in the first game. But in 2? I mean, I still like it, but I feel like a lot of the charm it had in the first game is mysteriously missing here. To start, the propeller lifts in mid are a lot smaller, and they both had their routes to the side platform cut off, making it so there's only one way to attack the enemy base. The unique tunnel on the left side got removed and replaced with a less fun and less effective propeller lift, and there are also a lot less inkable walls than there were in the original. The new Ancho V games is still a good map that I enjoy playing on thanks to a decent amount of movement options, as well as the propeller of still being fun to use, but compared to how incredible the original Office was, it's so disappointing. Also, I just want to point out that this is the last Splatoon 1 map to return it to, and then all the S1 maps in 3 were redone from the ground up, mostly for the worse. I bet the designer who made the decision to remodel Ancho V must feel like Oppenheimer right about now. Number 18, the Switches. Ink the Switches to move the ground, helping you advance, ascend, and defend. It's fun to screw over other players with this, and the map provides just enough side routes to help you if you get blocked off. That's a pretty big butt. Manta Maria is a boatload of fun. Sure, it has this game's trademark problem of forcing you to go through mid, but I don't mind it here, since its mid is fun to fight in thanks to the center pillar, and there are various routes in and out of it. So many of this map's walls are inkable, letting you hide in ink or swim up to higher ground to surprise the enemy. It's not amazing, since a few of its regions are a bit cramped, and let's face it, we've all fallen for the death pit on the left that looks like a lower platform. Why'd they make it look so much like regular ground? Anyway, in spite of its issues, I still like Manta Maria a 
ton, and I'm glad they immediately brought it back in 3. Share this with all your friends to totally coconut maul them. I'm gonna make so many enemies with this next entry. Anyway, I really like Arowana Mall in Splatoon 2. You may remember that I wasn't the biggest fan of this map back in the first game. In 2, however, I find it very fun. Out of every mediocre Splatoon 1 map, this is by far the one that improved the most in a later game. The middle, for one, feels a lot wider and much more manageable to fight in. If that wasn't enough, there's an entire new raised section to the left of Spawn that provides a lot of new options. These two seemingly simple fixes make the map so much more fun, and it really plays around with its verticality now. Plus, it looks great here. The more modern visuals make this map look and feel much more like an actual mall than a rundown war base. I can see why competitive players wouldn't like it since it's still kind of a straight line, which is made even worse by being in the game with Stingray. Why is it always Stingray? But from the eyes of a casual player, I love Arowana Mall in this game. It's so fun, and a massive improvement from the relatively underwhelming original. Number 15, the Maze Dasher. This station is littered with dash panels, which are a ton of fun to zip around. I wish the map had a wide shape rather than a long one, as I feel like it would have used the dash panels much better that way. Regardless, it's still pretty fun. Save money, live better. Walmart. What Makomart lacks in interesting aesthetics, it makes up for with a relatively fun, if somewhat cramped layout. Pretty much all the walls in mid are inkable, so you can easily ambush or be ambushed thanks to the wide amount of routes this offers. The bases are also solid, with various exits and defensive points, even if they can be hard to attack depending on the mode. Don't have much else to say, Makomart's just a perfectly solid, fun map, even if it isn't anything spectacular. Yes, I am real man, you wanna go skateboards? As someone who already likes Blackbelly Skate Park before, wow did to get a glow up in this game. It's not as big of a quality jump as Arowana's, but it's still so much better. It was mostly the same as its Splatoon 1 counterpart when it first returned to this game, but in the middle of this game's life, it got a rework that stretched its spawn regions out further back, making the overall map much larger as a result. The map feels so much better to play on now since the original's biggest problem, that being its small size, is fixed. It also retains all the best parts of the original, like the cool theme, the central tower, and the plethora of two-way routes. They took a map that was already tailored made for this series and made it way better. You love to see it. Number 12, Gusher Towns. Don't let the eel tail alley ass layout fool you, because this map uses gushers very well. Using them for cover and to reach higher ground is a lot of fun. Number 11, The Secret of Splat. Way slide cool if it was actually cool. The blocks in mid shifting up and down can drastically alter matches depending on how you position yourself. Number 10, The Bunker Games. A fan favorite shifty station, and for good reason. It addresses Turf War's big problem of only the last 30 seconds mattering, since parts of this map will periodically get closed off, forcing you to get in there and ink as much of the ground as you can to gain the advantage. It's genius. We are and the best Splatoon 1 map in Splatoon 2 is... Piranha Pit! I don't really know what to say about this map that I didn't already say in my Splatoon 1 map ranking. I guess I don't really like how you can't jump to one platform anymore due to the center conveyor belts being further apart, but that's just a nitpick. Aside from that, it's still good old Piranha Pit. The open layout, chaotic pace, seamless gimmick, and large amount of options make it one of the best maps in this game, both casually and competitively. Number 8, Grappling Girl. This station is covered with grapplings, which you can shoot to zip to other parts of the map to gain height and flank. It's a fun use of a single player gizmo I really miss. Number 7, The Chronicles of Rolonium. Flinging large rolls of Rolonium at enemies is so much fun, and the layout also offers a decent amount of movement options as well. Number 6, Sweet Valley Tentacles. This station's hook is its tentacles, which open up corresponding gates when destroyed. It provides an excellent dilemma of going on the offensive to open up routes into the enemy base, or defending your tentacles to keep your gates closed. They kick Panama out of Panama and make a canal. Snapper Canal is simply so much fun. It's one of the widest maps in the series to date, with a ton of possible routes to take and jumps to make. Despite its somewhat flat layout, battles on this map can be a little different each time thanks to its vast amount of set pieces. You could maybe argue that the center is a bit cramped, but they thankfully let you walk around it entirely, even if the paths you have to take are uninkable. I don't know what 13 year old me was on not caring for this map that much. It's a ton of fun, and it deserves to return in a game with better controls and balancing. Number 4, the ink is spreading. A far better use of spreaders than fancy spew. Here, you can control the spreader's colors with switches, and they're 
brilliant at helping you gain the advantage in battle. The middle switch is especially important for how much ink it covers, and it's fun to fight over that. Number 3, Furler in the Ashes. Marina popped off with the last few shifty stations. This one is incredible. Its usage and placement of furlers is genius, and using them to get to faraway land masses is insanely fun. The water level also drops halfway through a match, a la Mahi Mahi Resort, raising some of the terrain and opening new ground. It's one of the most fun PvP experiences in the series, and it still isn't even the best shifty station. The holder of that title is a station so good, I had to give it a dedicated entry of its own. I'm a fire in my laser! The final fest of Splatoon 2 was a time where you just had to be there. This three-day fest truly felt like a battle for the fate of the world, from its presentation, to its songs, to the returns of every previous shifty station, culminating with the final station, MC Princess Diaries. The finale of Octo Expansion was, and still is, one of the most hype moments of any Nintendo game for me, and basing this map on its last stretch was nothing short of a genius move. Fly Octo Fly will always play on this map, even in private battles, and hearing a final boss theme in a regular match is insanely hype. Speaking of which, Hyper Bombs will periodically drop onto the stage throughout the match. Blowing up the ones on the enemy's side can get you a lot of turf, providing an excellent dilemma of attacking or defending and keeping the match chaotic. No wonder we won. It's a ton of fun for just the first two minutes, but it peaks in the final minute with the voice to end all voices. Pearl herself drops down into the center of the map, letting the team who reaches her use her killer whale to destroy the other team. This map is the perfect celebration of this game, more than making up for a relatively basic layout with frantic, fun gameplay and an exhilarating presentation. I cannot think of a better send-off for this game than this, and I don't see how the eventual Final Fest of 3 could possibly top it. Despite all that, for the sake of fairness, I'm kinda forced to give the number one entry to a regular map. And besides, there's a good chance you already know what that regular map is. Yeah, it's the Reef. I think we all saw that one coming. I mean, how? How did the game that gave us the likes of Wahoo World and Gobi Arena also bless us with this masterpiece of a map? Like, this is how you make a Splatoon map. This is how it's done. And it was this game's de facto first map. Yeah, it did kinda need a rework to see its full potential, but they still peaked surprisingly early. It is the perfect size. It's big, but it also feels just tight and compact enough to make battles fun without feeling too cramped either. There are a ton of ways to get around this map. You could go straight to mid and charge across or under the bridge, or you could be sneaky and go off to the sides to try to flank the enemy. The sheer amount of routes this map offers makes it one of the most dynamic maps in the series, and as such, no two battles on it feel the same. Topped off with a uniquely chill vibe that's more in line with the hub worlds and the other maps, the reef is the map all others should strive to be like. It is perfect for casual and competitive players alike, and every match I've ever played on it has brought me joy, regardless of whether I win or or lose. As much as this fandom loves to fight, I'm glad we can at least all agree that the Reef is among the best multiplayer maps the series has ever given us. I know I said before that no map tops Splatoon 1 Flounder Heights, but I think this map might be the sole exception. Please, for the love of COD, bring it back in 3. It desperately needs it. Well, that was Splatoon 2. Don't get me wrong, this game is flawed as hell, from its weapon balancing, to its queue times, to some of its maps. But I'm not gonna let that mitigate the joy this game brought me when I was younger, and still brings me to this day. The vibes, the colors, the Splatfest, the Octo expansion, all of it just can't be matched, even if 3 might still be better for its quality of life changes alone. Still, I greatly appreciate Splatoon 2 for making not just me a fan, but so many other people fans as well. It may have started out as just Splatoon, but more, but it ended as a key stepping stone for getting this series where it is today. It still has a long way to go if it wants to match the likes of Zelda and Xenoblade in terms of excellence, but I thank this game for locking this series on that path.